Hello and welcome to this clinical video lecture from the Geishlich Plus U Spotlight project. My name is David Palombo and I'm a third year resident and PhD candidate in the Master of Periodontics and Implant Dentistry at the University Complutense of Madrid. Today's lecture is going to be covering a case report describing the management of a severe endoperiodontal lesion through a combined resective and regenerative approach which have been performed through the use of the surgical microscope. This case will allow us to revise the overall management of endoperiodontal lesions within the treatment of a periodontitis patient, the step-by-step -step surgical technique of an apically positioned flap with resective osseous surgery and root amputation, and finally the reconstruction of a post-extractive ridge with a bone augmentation procedure. As you know, endoperiodontal lesions have been recently reclassified in the 2017 World Workshop of Periodontology, where some innovative diagnostic criteria have been introduced, such as the presence or absence of an evident root damage, the presence or absence of periodontitis in the patients harboring the lesion, and of course the severity and extension of the lesion within the site of affection. And when we look at the case definition of an endoperiodontal lesion, we're basically talking about the presence of a periodontal and endodontic affection where a communication has been established between the two lesions. Thus, clinically wise, we're talking about a tooth or a root uh, which responds in a negative or altered way to the pulp vitality test which presents a deep pocket commonly extending up to the root apex and where the combination of these conditions most commonly results in an unfavorable or a hopeless prognosis. And this is the situation of the case that we're going to discuss today, in which uh, at the level of tooth number 26, so the upper left first molar, we can appreciate the presence of a deep pocket affecting the distal root, uh, combined with a negative response to the tooth vitality test and a radiographic image compatible with the presence of a periapical lesion. We can appreciate how the whole sextant of the patient has been rehabilitated with clearly over-contoured restorations and a crown on tooth number 27, which invade the space of the supracrestal soft tissues and present a morphology which does not provide adequate access for self-performed plaque control. And when we look at the overall view by sextants, the periodontal chart and the periapical radiographs, we see that in this case we have a periodontitis patient with some clear signs of gingival inflammation and plaque accumulation, with presence of some deep pockets in the posterior areas, and with images compatible with infrabony defects within a generalized horizontal bone loss pattern. And thus, uh, once we have established the bone loss to age ratio at the most severely affected site from periodontitis, we can thus diagnose a case of stage 3 generalized grade B periodontitis with the comorbidity of a grade 2 endoperiodontal lesion at tooth number 26 with no visible root damage. And so a periodontal therapy, of course, is delivered and within the first step of our treatment sequence, all the over restorations have been removed in order to eliminate any plaque retentive factor and root canal therapy at the level of tooth number 26 is provided in order to control the endodontic infection. Meanwhile, step 2 of periodontal therapy has been performed and 8 weeks after the treatment, uh, the patient is reevaluated in order to assess whether the endpoints of periodontal treatment have been met or not. And so, 8 weeks from therapy, even if we can appreciate a significant improvement in clinical signs of plaque control and gingival inflammation, when we look at the periodontal chart, we see that residual pockets are present at teeth number 24, 26 and 27, and that the extent of the restorative preparation, especially at tooth number 27, is extended below the gingival margin. Thus, we move to step 3 of therapy, where an apically positioned flap is planned, considering the probability of amputating the distal root of tooth number 26, in the case that a loss of attachment extended up to the root apex is confirmed intraoperatively. And in such a case, an immediate reconstruction of the alveolar ridge will be performed in order to avoid a soft tissue collapse within the alveolus of the distal root. Thus, the procedure starts with a combination of a distal wedge operation at the level of the tuberosity, specifically a rectangular distal wedge, combined with a thin palatal flap on the palatal aspect and an access flap on the buccal aspect. Thus, more in detail, uh, once we have uh, designed the two parallel incision of our distal wedge, 
uh, we move to the palatal aspect of our uh, sextant and with a sharp periosteal elevator we start to design our incision outline and this outline is then uh, followed with the 15c blade which shall basically allows us to start to sculpt our primary uh, split thickness uh, palatal flap so we see that we are anticipating with our uh, paramarginal incisions the final position of our flap once the path will be thinned and of course the osseous surgery will be performed. So with the 15C blade I'm trying to design my primary split thickness flap. Now I move to a 12 blade in order to uh, better achieve a perfect parallel angle parallel to the bone in this case and we start to elevate split thickness papillae at the interproximal level and at the level of the distal wedge. So in this flap design, the distal wedge is basically a big uh, surgical papilla, exactly as the surgical papilla that we see interproximally. So we elevate each surgical papilla, and once we have elevated every papilla split thickness, we move to the split thickness dissection of the palate, trying to maintain a even plane of dissection. So we maintain our blade parallel to the bone, up to reaching the adequate depth within the palate in order to achieve our uh, thin palatal flap. Then we move to a full thickness incision, so the uh, angulation of our blade moves from parallel to the bone to perpendicular to the bone, and with this perpendicular incision I'm moving from distal to mesial up to reaching the premolar area in order to completely separate the primary uh, thin palatal flap from a secondary deep full thickness palatal flap, which will be removed within the context of the resective procedure within the distal wedge operation. So we start to elevate full thickness the deep palatal flap, the second full thickness palatal flap, with a very uh, simple periosteal elevator or with a back action chisel and we try to remove uh, in the cleanest possible way uh, all the tissue of the palatal flap. We continue removing the distal wedge in order to achieve the plane of, of, the, uh, of the alveolar bone. So we see how we are liberating the insertion of uh, the periosteal insertions of our distal wedge and once the distal wedge has been removed we can appreciate the amount of tissue that we have removed and we can appreciate that our two buccal and palatal aspect of the wedge immediately close by first intention in a more apical position. And we see the adaptation of our thin palatal flap uh, in the alveolar crest before the osseous surgery. So we move to the buccal aspect in which we basically design uh, a modified Whitman flap uh, type of incision with 0.5 mm submarginal incisions which are beveled up to the bone crest and uh, designing a split thickness surgical papillae with the specific aim of thinning the tissues interproximally. So we see that we are elevating the split thickness papillae in order to thin the, the, the surgical papillae and leave a connective tissue core that will be eliminated during the root instrumentation uh, in the interproximal aspect. And we extend our incision up to uh, connecting with the buccal aspect of the distal wedge. And again, we see that in some specific area, we take advantage of the angulation of the number 12 blade in order to maintain an even plane of dissection. And differently from the palatal aspect, we see that on the buccal one, once we elevate the split thickness papillae, the buccal elevation is immediately performed full thickness. So there is no split thickness dissection of a primary and a secondary buccal flap. There is only one single flap with split thickness thinned surgical papilla and then a full thickness elevation. And the full thickness elevation allows us to expose the defect at the level of tooth number 26 and more specifically to see that at the level of the distal root uh, we are reaching the tooth apex with the loss of attachment. So once we have the intraoperative confirmation of the defect severity, and in addition we observe a clear proximity of the distal root of tooth number 26 with tooth number 27, the decision of amputating has been taken and the root resection is performed under the magnification of the surgical microscope. So using a diamond burr, a clean cut is performed and the residual uh, distal root of tooth number 26 is extracted.
Uh, once the extraction is performed, uh, a recontouring and reshaping of the root trunk coronal to the root resection is performed in order to eliminate uh, any over contour of the tooth surface, which could represent a factor for plaque accumulation and impair self-performed plaque control measures from the patient. So we move then to the palatal aspect where we perform the osteosurgery with the specific intent of eliminating the infrabony component between tooth number 26 and 27 which is represented from the crater that was present at this level. So the primary objective of the osteosurgery is not to achieve a positive bone anatomy, we're not looking for a positive architecture nowadays, but it is at least to avoid a negative architecture and to eliminate clear infrabony components. Uh, so a combination of osteoplasty and ostectomy is performed with round diamond burrs and manual instruments, more specifically bone chisels, in order to create a palatal ramp, so eliminate the palatal component of the crater between 26 and 27, and to create a smooth anatomy of the bone profile which will promote the adaptation of our flap on the palatal aspect of our intervention. So we are looking for any bone peak, widow peak, uh, bone balcony that could impair the soft tissue adaptation, specifically interproximally uh, in our uh, site of interest, and we are trying to create an homogeneous bone profile over the entire uh, area of, of the sextant. Again, we see the use of the diamond burr combined with the manual instruments to refine uh, the osteoplasty and the ostectomy at every tooth that is treated with this resective approach. So once the osteosurgery is performed, the adaptation of the soft tissues, so the palatal flap, the thin palatal flap, is checked out with the periodontal probe in order to see that we have adequate interproximal closure uh, through the combination of the thin palatal flap and the osteosurgery. So once we completed the osteosurgery and the palatal aspect, we moved back to the buccal one in order to treat the post-extractive defect that is present on the distal aspect of tooth number 26. So with the primary aim of avoiding the infiltration and, and collapse of the soft tissues within the defect, uh, we reconstructed the ridge with a collagenated bovine bone mineral graft, so BIOS collagen, which was combined with a bioguide membrane. So the graft was adapted in the defect and the membrane was placed to protect the graft to provide mechanical stabilization and most of all to avoid soft tissue infiltration within the graft material. Uh, as we are not creating an over contouring, we are staying within the anatomical contours of the defect, there is no need to stabilize the membrane with tags or pins and the simple adaptation of the membrane and the coverage by the flap is sufficient to provide enough stability. So we move to the suture line in which a series of modified internal uh, vertical mattress sutures has been performed interproximally. And this type of suture provides a good combination between a compressive effect on the palatal aspect and a tight adaptation of the tissues interproximally. Uh, we see that the distal wedge has been closed with simple interrupted sutures and in the interproximal space between 26 and 27 we have a very small second intention right below the pontent point by but the complete area of the bone ramp is covered by the surgical papilla of the palatal flap and the area in which the bone reconstructive procedure has been performed is completely covered by the surgical papilla of the palatal flap. Uh, so we achieve a good adaptation uh, of our tissues around the emergence profile of the roots and we see that the restorative space has been restored uh, leaving adequate space for the supracrestal soft tissues. So when we check the healing at 14 days uh, we see that uh, residual inflammation is present of course in the area of the surgery uh, and some granulation tissue is present interproximally but overall the objectives of the surgery at this phase of healing have been met. So Approximately two months after surgery, uh, the restorative phase of the treatment has been delivered and specifically lithium disilicate overlays have been uh, provided to uh, tooth number 26 and 27 within the new technologies department of the University Complutense of Madrid. So when we move to the one year follow-up, we see that at this short time frame, our treatment has been quite successful. Uh, there are no residual pockets with no sides bleeding on probing, so the endpoints of periodontal therapy have been met. Uh, 
and tooth number 26 did not undergo any mechanical complication after the amputation, nor the restorations have undergone any mechanical or biological complications as, as an adequate space was provided to the restorative colleague uh, to create an adequate tooth anatomy away from the soft tissues. So as we can confirm from the clinical pictures and the video, now the patient has been provided with a tooth morphology that is conductive for self-performed plaque control measures and adequate plaque control and adequate control of periodontal inflammation is present at this time frame. And finally, I would like to thank our friends at Geislich Biomaterials and in IPSA uh, for the privilege of participating in the Geislich Plus CU Spotlight project and for organizing this lecture. And of course, thank you very much to all of you for your kind attention. Please do not hesitate to contact me through social media or email for any further information.